Hey, to thanks so much for joining me. Good to see you. Thrilled, thrilled to have you. Um, between me and beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and, you and I are between them and their beer, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, you've had quite the journey from Google to Neva and now Snowflake. Just like going back to the Google days, what, like, what signs were there then of the moment we're in now? Or how much do you think you, the Google exec, saw this or, or this is taking you by surprise? Well, I, certainly I don't think any of us predicted the chat GPT moment. Um, I think we actually launched the first deep learning model um, for PCTR prediction, which is a logistic regression problem, if I remember correctly, in 2011 or 12, so a while ago. Um, in fact, the first uh, solution to this problem, which was called SmartAss, um, which we call Smart Ads outside, um, was built in 05 um, by people that knew nothing uh, about any traditional machine learning. We just hooked up a bunch of systems that let me write a feedback loop, and it kind of magically um, worked out. Um, so the tech has been broadly adopted for a very, very long time. But if you're asking me, like, signs of greatness, I think I read a paper 2016, if I remember correctly, um, that basically said uh, you can get transitivity in machine translation. Um, you train something on, like, English to French, um, you know, and the same model on French to German and all of a sudden you could actually go from English to German and vice versa, and it just like blew all of our minds. Right. Um, and to me, I think that was the beginning of sort of the magical things that a whole bunch of people started doing, both inside and, uh, uh, and outside, um, which is entire fields were getting wiped out by you know, new papers that came along. What, what year do you found Neva? Uh, Neva was founded 2019. Uh, and you sell like last year, basically. That's correct. Yeah, that's right. That's right. What, I mean, what is what is your biggest lesson like from from that experience? <laughs> uh, timing is everything. <laughs> Hard to compete against a search juggernaut, or? Uh, I mean, well, yes, that that. But you know, Nevo, for those that don't know, um, was a search engine, um, and uh, looking back, the foundation of the company was a purely abstract concept. We I ran ads at Google. Um, I ran search ads for over 10 years. Um, and my entirely abstract thesis was the only way this is going is down in terms of quality and what we could do because that was the pressure that we lived in day in and day out. Early days of Google used to have... Uh, because, you, because of the switch from sending people to websites to keeping people on websites? No, pages? it was much more... Um, uh, the more ads you show, the more money you make. Right. Um, you know, you can, you can come up with fancy arguments for what is user quality, how do you measure it, um, but a, you know, this is a surface where a pixel more of vertical space is worth a gazillion dollars. Um, and you're like, I really shouldn't add one more, one more pixel line worth of ads, but you know, when there's pressure, there's always a few more pixels that are, are, that are just fine. Um, and so Neva was founded on the thesis that there had to be a better search. Certainly, we didn't see like you know ChatGPT coming. Um, but for us, our aha moment was I would say early 22, um, when we then again realized that um, problems that we have always struggled with, um, things like uh, um, you know having people wade through a very long page in order to find an answer, um, which is you know what search makes you do. You know, I joke to people, I want to look through a six-page web page, said no one. It's like, you know, it's not something anybody enjoys. They're like, give me the answer. Um, and so Google had made little attempts at doing this um, pre-foundation uh, models uh, with things like featured snippets, um, where if there was enough information about the structure of the query, the answer you're looking for, you could pick out the section, show it directly in the result, which of course pissed the website owner off because they were like, wait, you just killed my monetization right. opportunity. And so it always had to be done very tastefully. It was also very limited in terms of just precision recall trade-offs, what you could do with it and stuff like that. But we realized early 22 that language models were, um, were a big breakthrough. You could take a page and you, know, you could generate for yourself on some pretty cheap models an abstractive summary of the page, which is wild. And you're saying, 
you know, give a model 1,500 words, and it'll come back with three sentences that capture what this page is about most of the time. It's, it's pure magic. Um, and then when my team came to me, I have to confess to this, and said like, oh, Sridhar, we can do this at a page level, we can also do this at a whole query level, just like summarize all of the results and produce, you know, the best result that there was. I was like, yeah, I don't see this happening very soon. Um, but lo and behold, a few months later, we actually had working prototypes, and then it became a race to how do you scale this fast enough? How do you do things like pre-compute summaries of four billion pages sitting in the index? Like, are how you, do you manage latency? Are you latency? surprised Google is putting AI results at the top? No, or what do you think of that strategy? Uh, it's a logical thing to do. It's the you know the slow boiling of the frog. It's okay. <laughs> you do it here. You do it there. Some people complain. You wait for a little bit. You know, there's a problem. You pull it back. You know, you've been through this dance before. And okay, and then get, getting to Snowflake, like, yeah, tell us a little bit of the story. How did you decide, it's such a, uh, you know, big role, big role, big change, like different company, like how did that come together? Like what excited you about the opportunity? I mean, to be honest, uh, the reason uh, we at Neva was just not my decision, it was my co-founder, it was most of the senior engineers. Um, we decided to go to Snowflake, you know, for first of all, for people reasons. Um, we met the founders, we met Christian, our head of product. Uh, we, had, uh, we went to talk to them for like an hour to, uh, to tell them about Neva. That turned into a five hour meeting where we talked about all the things we had done, what we could do at uh, Snowflake. Um, it was clear that the company had a big hole when it came to search and how to think about AI and how that related to the core data business. Um, and that's sort of how that came about. It came like the whole transaction happened uh, in two days. Sort of weird how like, you did know, you, uh, life did you decision. Did you think, oh, I might become the CEO of this guy? Not a chance. <laughs> and so my original deal with Frank was that I would stay for six months. Um, you know, uh, the acquisition closed Memorial Day um, in 23. I was like, I'll stay until end of November. I'll go my way and figure out what I want uh, to do. Um, and, you know, that was, that, that was a deal that brought me to Snowflake. Do you think, had Snowflake been a little bit in denial about the AI wave, or how do you score how much it had embraced what was going on in AI? Like, look, there's, it's this, this thing of how quickly you should react to something is always super tricky for companies, uh, super in, including startups. Um, you jump the gun, um, well, also depends on whether you're resource constrained or not. Most companies are resource constrained. And so there is such a thing as jumping the gun too early, wasting a lot of resources on something that might not go anywhere. I should know, I started a Web3 company. Um, and, uh, um, and so, you know, I, I sort of, it's hard to grudge people. Um, I would more say that um, uh, they turned the gas on at the right time. It was early last year. Um, we had mostly had at Snowflake a partnership strategy when it came to, when it came to AI. Um, it was a pivotal moment. In the space of a few months, we went from, oh, AI is mostly going to be done by partners to, okay, here's the platform layer, and here's how it's going to transform the entire data stack. Here's what an application layer looks like. This is what we are going to do. This is what we want partners to do. Um, that thing as a strategy came together incredibly quickly. I was also followed up by some pretty incredible execution um, that pretty much brought, as I said, both platforms and applications on top of it uh, to, the, uh, to the market. Um, companies change. I, I think I made it, uh, you know, reference in the title of the panel. Why, why do you think, you know, intelligence is going to come to data rather than the data go to where the intelligence is? Or what gives you sort of the strategic positioning to be a powerful player in what's happening in AI? I'll give a slightly different question about sort of the entire AI wave, which I actually think is a, is, is a lesson for startups as well, um, which is, um, uh, you know, there is, especially in the enterprise, there's a process for adoption. And uh, you and I aren't really going to change it, meaning uh, every enterprise wants to go through um, like a security review for any app that they're going to let in. Um, and because those teams are like, you know, there are uh, enough issues going on um, with loss of data and stuff like that, they're always going to take that seriously. Uh, if you go to a Morgan Stanley or a JP Morgan, they're going to be like, we want to be pretty careful about who we want to work with. 
Um, and so there is that sort of impotence, whether we like it or not. You have to trust the you have to trust the relationships. And I'd also say we are now in like you know the fourth or the fifth generation of companies that are uh, dealing with these platform shifts, including some you know failed ones. Whether it is the Alexa style AI assistants that I'm sure all of you have boxes at home that you don't touch, um, and uh, or other things that have sort of come and uh, come and gone. So I think all of the incumbents are very aware of the opportunity. Um, so you and I can talk back and forth about should the AI go uh, to data or data come to AI, uh, but a snowflake perspective is like, wait, we have 10,000 customers and 10 years worth of relationships with people that trust us, that put all their data with us. Um, why would I want to not make any AI application um, trivial for people to build on Snowflake? It might be the case that there is a very special company that does something amazing that we cannot. Obviously, it's a, it's a vibrant system of uh, ecosystem of startup. Um, and for that, people might decide, I'm going to take data out from cloud storage or from Snowflake. I will carefully reproduce all of the ACLs that I have, the, you know, the governance, the data, figure out incremental updates, um, and then figure out how I'm going to set up uh, uh, you know, security for this new application and my users, I'm kind of like, good luck. Um, you better be special. Uh, and uh, so this is a lot of, you know, we have a partnership strategy where we do work with startups to add on things to what Snowflake can do. Uh, but the data gravity is, is, is very real. And as I said, what we can do with a great team is most common applications, whether it is chatbots or agents that can talk to data, um, we're going to make it trivial for our customers to be able to create. Is, how much demand is there to, to chatbot your data? Or like, do you think, besides like, you know, what are my financials this quarter? Or sort of like, are there really that many use cases that people are just gonna like go to their data, type in sort of a text query and get some sort of answer? Or are we gonna hit some sort of ceiling? 100%. Um, this is a great question. Uh, and again, there are uh, parallels for how to think about this question. It's also a little bit of like, what are the AI applications that you see getting, uh, getting adopted? Uh, the way at least I think about this in the context of Snowflake is, as I said, we have um, an AI almost like infrastructure layer, uh, which just means that anyone that can write SQL can access models, can do various things with these, um, with these models. Um, we are actually seeing a fair amount of usage just from writing data pipelines. Mm. Um, remember, if you wanted to extract numbers from a PDF um, or you wanted to extract some subset of information from a document or summarize, uh, not so long ago, these used to be software engineering projects. Right. Uh, you're like, you needed your software engineers, they would get some API from AWS, figure out something incremental. Um, we are like, uh, okay, that can be set up by a SQL analyst in approximately 30 seconds uh, to be able to do that. So we see a lot of like AI being used for data pipelines. Uh, that sounds boring, uh, but it's also pretty exciting because all of a sudden, uh, for example, our healthcare customers are able to say things like, wait, can I go through all of my clinician notes for the last four years and find me a list of patients that you know, had cough symptoms in 2020? Mm. Um, previously, that used to be a job that somebody wrote to try and figure this out. Right now, it's like that's a SQL statement that you, know, that, that, that you sort of tinker with. Uh, so that's one layer of applications. Uh, absolutely, we make chatbots easy to create. I would put chatbots at the same level as um, the search boxes that you see all across the web. Okay. Um, who here knows a search engine other than Google or uh, Microsoft? Um, you know, but yes, your 401k page uh, or uh, your IT page or anything else absolutely has a search box. What I mean by that is these are modest. Right. It's not going sort of to nice life change the world. It's yeah. a nice to have. I mean, let's face it, as I said, it is a, um, we have one for all of our uh, IT help text. Um, and the other day, I was like, huh, I'm at Snowflake, I, but I don't really have an AWS account because I didn't have to touch it. So how do I create uh, an AWS account in the confines of my Snowflake corporate environment? And sure enough, there's a page and it, you know, the assistant fished it out and the steps that I had to follow. It was a nice to have. It's not going to be dramatic. On the other hand, I think access to data broadly is more powerful than you think um, because it cuts out the whole analyst, BI intelligence, BI tool, you have to remember that there is a huge amount of friction. 
anytime a business user wants anything other than the dashboard that they've been given, they pretty much get to talk to a human who has to then figure out like what SQL query to write and how to push it into what BI tool. It's like, it's a two week long right. update. For a whole class of those, um, we just enable flexible access. So that's the promise of that. If you ask me what's the thing that uh, our customers are most excited about, it's actually this. Um, because it just solves the pain right. um, of even simple data access. Anything that's out of the ordinary right now with enterprise data is a pain. How, how much is Databricks on your mind as you pursue an AI strategy? I mean, it seemed like the tabular acquisition was perhaps meant to be antagonistic, or how did you take that? Uh, you switch topics here in a pretty yes, big way. Yes. <laughs> I, I watch the clock, and I'm yeah, not going to let that one go by. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's actually a whole different area. Um, and it's a broad industry trend that I think actually has an impact on, uh, on AI, uh, which is interoperable storage. Uh, boring as heck, uh, but uh, you know, more and more companies, um, the, 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 you know, the CSPs, um, but Databricks, Snowflake are all betting on interoperable storage and cloud storage. Why? Um, you know, our customers want it. Um, and cloud storage is also the place where pretty much all enterprise data lives. Uh, so there's absolutely a push for truly interoperable formats. Uh, previous experiment by said company, um, you know, created a format that was open but not really open. Um, and this is why Iceberg won out in a, uh, in a pretty big way. It's important to understand that the Iceberg format itself uh, is an Apache project. It's not controlled by any company. Um, buying Tabular does not let you control uh, Iceberg. Um, they do have a catalog product, uh, and uh, we now have a catalog product um, as well. So I would characterize the acquisition much more um, as an acceptance that Delta has no future, um, and uh, that the world of data is really sitting with interoperable data. Uh, but just, you know, I said earlier, every generation of Silicon Valley companies um, learns from the previous one, and I think there's a lesson here for the CSPs, for us, uh, in terms of how open source can actually be a control vehicle, um, and certainly that's not going to happen to Iceberg. Are you, are you all in on open source? Do you see your AI strategy as totally open source? Uh, look, similar to uh, Meta or Google, okay, um, open source is a complicated phrase. This is Meta. <laughs> yeah, I think we learned that. I yeah, don't know if you right? saw the earlier open source. This is a loaded. It's, uh... Yeah, it's super loaded. Um, is Meta an open source company? Anyone here think <laughs> that? Meta creates some open source products that happen to be very useful to a bunch of us. All of us are thrilled, like Llama 3, 400, yay! Um, but they are in no hurry to open source the code to like Facebook or Instagram. Uh, and there are aspects of what we do um, where we want to support the open source community and lean in truthfully. And so, for example, this is why when we released Arctic, um, we said, hey, clean Apache to license, you do what you want um, with it. Um, we also think that it is kind of unfortunate uh, that we live in the world of like Twitter publications. Uh, it's a serious problem. It just means basically, you know, you can trust nothing you read about AI because no one's actually bothering to read any of the papers. Um, forget actually verifying whether a paper is true or not. That's the collective world that we live in. We just chase the latest rumor and say like, that must be true. And two years later, somebody comes out and says, oh wait, chinchilla. Yeah, they made a bunch of assumptions that are wrong. Here's a uh, new paper you should read. Right. Um, and so with open source, I think like especially when it comes to language models, uh, I think, you know, as I said, we want to be good citizens when it comes to language models, when it comes to streamlit, um, when, um, you know, when it comes to things like iceberg support. Um, but are we going to open source Snowflake, the core uh, data engine? No. And I think that's fine. Right. For, for my last question, I mean, where do you want Snowflake to be in five years? Like, if you're seizing this moment of AI with the ups and downs, like, what's your hope and how much of the business is oriented around everything that's happening in, in generative AI? Look, our core strength is in data. We are a data club. Uh, what we mean by that is we are an amazing place uh, to store, retrieve, process data 
Um, our st early strength came from collaboration around data. Companies like Fidelity pretty much mandate that all data going in and out of Fidelity is done via Snowflake sharing. Um, and increasingly, we have an application ecosystem that writes the applications that are data-centered um, on top of Snowflake. That's the core of Snowflake. That drives growth. Um, having said that, um, AI is going to be a pretty big opportunity regardless of AGI or not. It comes from things like these magical transformation abilities to go from what humans say to what is sitting in structured data. So I see that as a pretty big accelerant uh, to the core strength of uh, Snowflake. And that's sort of how we think about investing as well. And over the next five years, um, I want to grow, like my bar is to grow way faster than the CSPs because we think a, a unified AI data cloud that puts data at the center um, is going to be more and more important in this ongoing shift from, um, from on-prem computing to cloud computing. Well, one more question, just because of something you said. The AGI, like you're the CEO of this like real company, how do you deal with like, maybe we'll have artificial general intelligence, maybe we don't, like, do you th spend time thinking about it or you're like, someday it's gonna hit me in the face? Or like, how do you think about AGI is like a CEO, a serious company. Even, even before AGI, um, even before AGI, I tell people, listen, I am a reading, writing, talking machine. That's all I do. Seems to me that a language model should be able to do a damn good job of this. Right. <laughs> um, you know, I don't worry as much about things like, things like AGI. You know, I, I struggle even to reliably predict is there a... Um, you know, a GPT-5 class model coming and what's the delta and how do we measure it. Um, you know, five more percentage point jumps in MMLU hardly seems inspirational. I'm right. like, congratulations. You can pass the various exams I passed when I was 16 and 17. <laughs> that sounds not all like, as smart as you are, probably. <laughs> that sounds like a real <laughs> talent. Um, so I think it is in the imponderables, like uh, is it able to actually get through more complicated problems, more multi-step one. Uh, one of the problems I love giving every new model I get my hands on is the game of, uh, uh, you know, is the game of 24. Um, you know, can you add up, add up numbers or combine numbers in such a way that you, can get, that you can get 24? It's easy to construct examples in your head and then you see the model struggle with it all the time. Um, so I would say I'm pretty excited about jumps that can make models think deeper, think harder. Um, but all of the research so far, if you look at things like AlphaGo um, or how we got really, really good at chess, um, they have all been in environments where the long-term planning um, had like this side model that could assess the state of the world. Right. If you're in an open-ended context, I have a gazillion steps, each of them can branch in a gazillion ways, it becomes really hard to construct like something that can help guide you. Um, and even these, these jumps, you know, NeurIPS papers, for example, that talk about this is how you do long-term planning, they have some construct that makes the problem of judging progress easier, while in real life, you and I can make a pretty complicated plan for here's what we're going to do over the next three days, keep, them, keep it in our head and make progress towards that kind of a goal. Those kinds of things would be cool, but I don't even have a mental framework for saying how does one measure that and say things are substantially better. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's good.